Are we headed toward a one-world government, a one-world religious system? Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of the time we are living in? Are we in the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the world as we know it? And what are the increase of UFO sightings? While we may disagree as to what is causing the phenomenon, we can agree that it is real burgeoning and not going away. Is this the coming great deception that ancient prophecy warned us about? Does time seem to be accelerating? Join me, your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli, as we explore these and other riveting and stimulating topics. This is Acceleration Radio. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. Welcome to yet another romp into the strange, bizarre, and uh, we go places where very few people want to go something I do pretty much 24-7. I consider myself a watchman. And by the way, I was on a show last Saturday. We posted the link up on my blog, lamarzuli.wordpress.com, if you're interested in checking that out. Matthew Miller's the host of the End Time Tribune. We had Stan Deo, Larry Taylor, and myself. And uh, we did this roundtable, and it was just absolutely incredible, folks. Absolutely incredible, because we really got into some subjects. Um, and what was interesting about this, in, in my opinion, I'm sorry, and Stuart Best was the fourth, that's right, Stuart Best. So Stan Day, Stuart Best, Larry Taylor, Matthew Miller is the host of myself. There was no collusion between the guests. Matthew Miller threw the question out to us, and it was a roundtable. He said, are we, in, um, are we in the birth pangs that are talked about in Matthew 24? The birth pangs are wars and rumors of wars, famines and pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places, and troublesome times. When you see these things, what things? The things I just mentioned, look up, because the second coming is about to happen. That's what it talked about, okay? And what's interesting, without any collusion between any of us, we all agreed that these were the birth pangs. These were the birth pangs that we are in. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, because, you know, folks, it is... Uh, <laughs> It just gets stranger and stranger around here every week. Um, of course, the tragic events unfolding in Arizona <clears throat> over the weekend. <clears throat> and I'm going to read my blog uh, that I did on the 11th. Uh, I just felt very, uh, let me put it this way, I just felt like I had, I had to do this. I had to comment on it. Uh, it was time to take a look at this thing. And what led me to that was the picture that they showed of this nutcase, Jared Lawyer, the alleged gunman, and, you know, pretty much, we have to say alleged because he hasn't gone through the uh, trial process yet, but there's too many witnesses. The guy did the deed. But the one picture that they showed, <coughs> excuse me, on the media over and over again, <coughs> excuse me, let me put this on mute so I can really get a good call. I'll be right back, folks. Ah, oh, yes, dead air. <coughs> the radio's nightmare. The radio's host nightmare. So let me get a slop of water here. I have been fighting something in my throat for a while. You can pray for those of you who are listening. Pray that my throat would clear <coughs> and that it would um, get better. I would certainly, I covered your prayers. I appreciate them. But when I saw this picture, I recognized immediately that the image that I saw was that of something else inside uh, Mr. Logner. And um, I wrote the blog. It was called A Man Possessed. I'm just going to take a minute here and read that. Then I'm going to comment on some news stories because things are happening all over the globe, folks. It's, it's not business as usual, in my opinion. And the other three watchmen that we had on that program, the End Time Tribune with Matthew Miller, certainly would concur. <clears throat> A Man Possessed, commentary analysis by L.A. Marzulli. When I first heard about the shooting in Arizona, I began to ask, what are we looking at? Over the last several days, the stories have now emerged that Jared Laudner, the gunman, had a satanic altar set up in his backyard. Before I get too much further into this blog, let me ask you something. Look at the picture to your left. Look into this guy's eyes. The eyes are the windows to the soul. Who do you think you're looking at? <clears throat> I recognize those eyes, and so does my friend and colleague, Russ Dizdar. I spoke to Russ last night on the phone, and we discussed the shooting. Both of us agreed that this guy was most likely a programmed assassin that was switched on to recreate as much mayhem as possible. We also believe that he was instructed to kill himself, but his rampage was cut short when he was tackled and thrown to the ground. 
We need to realize that Loger had extra ammo clips with him, so that if he hadn't been stopped, he would have reloaded and killed as many people as possible before turning the gun on himself. Here's the question. Is this guy a super soldier? Was he programmed to kill? If so, who switched him on and for what purposes? I don't have the answers to this, but Russ and I agreed that this guy wasn't crazy. He was deliberate and acted in a trained way. He was focused, calm, and deadly. While the mainstream media won't touch this paradigm, Russ and I do. <clears throat> Yesterday we learned that Longer had a makeshift satanic altar in his backyard. When I viewed it, I wasn't impressed with it. It looked more like a prop to me. In closing today's post, like the video I posted a while back, Madness in the Fast Lane, we are not sure what we are looking at here. To me, just looking at the photo is a dead giveaway. The guy looks possessed. Russ Dizdar believes, as I do, that these satanic super soldiers are programmed to cause as much chaos as possible. The roots of this goes back to WW2 in Nazi Germany. MK Ultra is taken from a German mind control. We know that our CIA, CIA used this to try to create the perfect assassin. Below is the video that was taken at the congressional hearings about mind control. You will notice that this woman was trained in Arizona. God help us if it's real, folks. I would encourage you to go to that blog. It's, um, it's yesterday's blog. And uh, check it out. There's some links to YouTube, which actually shows the CIA uh, mind control congressional hearings. You will find it riveting and fascinating. There are several witnesses that stand or that sit and give their testimony. Um, don't take my word, folks, for it. Do a little bit of research on your own and check it out. The link's available. Meanwhile, in Iran, they're rounding up Christians. Uh, um, so what else is new? So much for the tolerance of Islam. And, of course, what really is on my mind tonight, there's so many things, but, but um, you know, folks, the, the floodwaters are still raging in Australia. Uh, some, some of the floodwaters, there was a, there was a, a YouTube video, I actually, um, I have that on the blog. If, if you scroll down, you can see it. It's just unbelievable. Um, you'll, it's on today's post. It says, wild video, Australia's raging floodwaters washed away parking lot of cars. And I saw that yesterday, and it was, it's just unbelievable to look at. The floodwaters in Australia now have covered the area the size of France and Germany combined. It's a huge amount of land. It dwarfs Katrina, like a hundred times uh, worse than what, what we experience in Katrina. It's, uh, it's getting crazy out there, folks. That's all I can tell you. Uh, snow in 49 states, including Hawaii. <clears throat> I can't remember the last time I heard that. The Haitian earthquake one year later, the squalid tent cities where rape gangs and disease run rife. There's over $1 billion in the United States coffers that were slated to Haiti. It's still sitting there, folks, which begs the question, why? What's going on? What are we really looking at here? Rape gangs and disease run rife. You want to check that out. Housing market slips into depression territory. Look, folks, if I had if I had some really good news to tell you, I would. And, you know, people go, oh, Marshall, he's always, you know, think what you want to think. I'm just reading the headlines to you. I'm just reading the headlines. I was on that show on Saturday. Four men sat down with the host, Matthew Miller. We were asked, are these the birth pangs? We all concurred. We all agreed. Yeah, we think they are. I'm not the only guy who's tooting his horn this way, who's trying to shout out the warning, folks, because it's here. This thing is coming down. He is coming back. We are moving. We are accelerating. What do I say here every, every, every time I do the show? Is there a war coming in the Middle East? Are we headed toward a one-world government, a one-world religious system? Will America be attacked again? Do ancient prophetic texts warn of the time we are living in? Are we in the last days, the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the world as we know it? And guys, I got, guys, you know, ladies and gals, I gotta <laughs> let me let me back up, ladies and gents. I gotta tell you that I think we are. And so do the other three men on the panel. I know Matthew Miller concurs. Why? Because the signs are all around us. And so everything I pointed to tonight goes into that, looks into that, factors into that. I don't know, folks. It is what it is. You know, if you haven't picked up a Watcher's DVD, we had another um, 
wonderful accolade from Sharon Gilbert. That's PID Radio, Derek and Sharon Gilbert. And, and Sharon just gave us a stellar review uh, of, the, of the DVD. I'm going to post that probably tomorrow. But, you know, Dirk uh, Vanderplug of UFO, UFO Digest says, well, to begin with, it is one, if not the best video documentary, documentary I've ever seen. Bob Ulrich's Prophecy of the News says, this is the best TV that has come across my desk in a long time, and I've seen just about everything. Pastor Chris Ward, who we've had on the show a while back, says, Watchers DVD is the best production I have ever witnessed regarding the UFO phenomena. So there it is, folks. People um, on both sides of the aisle telling us that we got something, and frankly, I do believe we have something there. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we live in tenuous times. There's no doubt about it. And last week we had the bird um, dropping, and it was not only in Louisiana, it was worldwide. Uh, 20,000 crabs, 40,000, I'm sorry, 40,000 crabs watched up in the UK. Thousands of fish on the beaches of, of, the, uh, of the Great Lakes. And on and on and on it goes. Now the Ayafala Hoka volcano in Iceland is beginning to erupt. 7.0 earthquake today in Indonesia. You know, I'm not making this stuff up. Not making this stuff up. It's, um, it is just unbelievable, folks. And you have to decide where we are. The other thing is, uh, with all the stuff that's going on with the natural disasters, food prices are going through the roof. If you don't have food now, may I suggest, please, please, go out and stock up with a, as many canned goods as you possibly can. Because you know why? If there's a food shortage, you're going to thank me, trust me. Get some food and water, get four to six months, because you don't know what's coming. You really don't. And it's, when it happens, it's too late. It's too late. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest tonight is Rob Skiba. Rob Skiba II is an award-winning documentary filmmaker, entrepreneur, published author, artist, public speaker, trainer, teacher, and Army veteran, former missionary, and active member of three charitable organizations serving on several boards of directors. He has written and directed numerous theatrical plays, including performances in New York, Connecticut, and throughout western Massachusetts. He's been an actor ever since the founding of his high school drama club in 86. Since then, he has helped to start several community theater groups, as well as the drama ministry at his home church, and has toured the country with a traveling acting troupe. A graduate of the Hollywood Film Institute, his lifelong dream has been to produce powerful television and motion picture productions. He is currently in production on a television talk show and has numerous projects in various stages of development. He's happily married, has a teenage son, and lives in the colony, Texas. Rob Skiba, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you for showing up here. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to um, basically ask you a, a very basic question. Um, basically, how did you get into all this? What what motivated you to look at film? When was the first time you can remember when you were a child that you looked at film or in your teenage years and you said, "That's what I want to do." When when did it hit you? 1977. That was the year that I accepted Christ as my Savior. I was seven years old in 1977, and that was the same year that Star Wars came out. <laughs> and uh, I was the um, the only boy in my family. I have one sister and all girl cousins. And that was also the year my grandfather retired. And so he was like, what do you want to do today, Robbie? And I said, I want to see Star Wars. Well, I saw it 13 times in the theater the first year it came out, <laughs> and I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the rest of my life from that point on, and uh, I got busy right away. It was probably maybe a year later that I got an 8 millimeter film camera at a garage sale, and I had that thing glued to my face most of my life growing up <laughs> through my parents' basement into a, my own little sound studio and little movie stage, um, had models hanging from the ceiling and all that. And uh, continued to do that till I got into high school. Uh, at that time, I thought maybe I wanted to be an astronaut. So I uh, focused on my grades, and right after I got out of high school, I went into the Army uh, to learn how to fly helicopters because I had learned that the, the astronauts learned how to, to fly the lunar lander by learning how to fly helicopters. Plus, my dad was a helicopter pilot, so I followed in his footsteps. I did that for eight years. Got out of there, uh, did a year with an organization whose initials ended up being C and I and A, 
<laughs> so it was not what you might usually think of those initials, uh, or was it? <laughs> uh, that's the question I've had for a long time now. But uh, what happened was when I was about 24, 25, they wanted to send me to Panama on this paramilitary operation deal, and it was one of those situations where if I got hurt, sick, killed, or kidnapped, nobody knew I existed. And so I was like, you know, I'm a little too young for nobody to know that I exist. And so I decided to go back to my old dream, which was filmmaking, and uh, I started doing corporate video first. I was through film school in 95 and 99, and uh, did corporate video from 94 till 2004, and then uh, I got hired at East West Ministries International, International Missions Organization in 2004, and uh, traveled around the world as a uh, filmmaking missionary. I've uh, been to 15 countries in the last six and a half years, and... Um, I, I always said it took an act of God to get me into that job, and I said it would take an act of God to get me out. And about this time last year, that act of God took place where he, in no uncertain terms, basically just plugged the USB cable in my head and downloaded 72 episodes of a TV series that uh, I feel like he really wants to get out. And so I left my... I, I took a step of faith this time last year, and... Uh, told me, you know what, i got to go after this, this thing God's placed in my heart. So uh, they gave me a 90-day extension in April 1st of uh, 2010. I stepped out into the abyss of nothingness <laughs> to pursue this dream. You know, and I have to say, you know, with, with the, the intro that you just gave and reading the headlines and everything, you know, I, I do think about all those things, and I think, God, you know, if everything is going to hell in a handbasket like it seems like it is, it certainly does, doesn't I'm it? Gonna care about a TV show? What am I doing here? You know, I need to be digging a bunker or something. You know, and you know, I have to tell you that that I'm in Proverbs three, five, and six mode right now because I can't deny what He's doing in my life and the things that He's showing me. And every time I think I got to give up and and just freak out, you know, I heard your your uh, end end time Tribune show the other day. And it came up a couple of times, we, God has not given us a spirit of fear. Mm-hmm. It's real easy to get into fear when we think about all these things that are going on. And, and trust me, I'm there. You know, I get there sometimes. And so I wonder, but I guess this guy emailed me today. He says, you know, I bet you probably get a lot of emails, but I honestly can't believe I just stumbled across your seed website. Not only did I find your information exciting and fascinating, but it is exactly what I've been studying about for the past several months. Wow. A few weeks ago, I told my wife, I wish someone would make a movie about this stuff. There's so much information and so much that society either doesn't know or doesn't connect the dots, like the Nephilim and the gods and DNA and modification of all that kind of stuff. I had to laugh, though, because I honestly think we'll be raptured sooner than later. <laughs> and I figured there was a reason. Uh, to, there was no reason to even think about such things. But I'm excited you're creating a TV series about this. I'm also excited because you have connected a lot of dots for me, truly I'll be praying for you and this series. I really think it's an eye-opening, and hopefully at least some Christians will see the truth. He says, I can go on and on, but just know you are what you are doing is good, it's right, it's perfect for this time. So, and I've had several of those just this last week, because really since December 21st, 2010, I've had almost kind of a, a moment of crisis in my faith in this whole thing because of all the things that you guys have been talking about, and I've been looking at those things like a watchman myself. So all I can say is, you know, we're told to occupy until he comes, and I guess for me, occupying means doing this. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it's really interesting. I, I, I find myself in a position that I'm in, and, I mean, I can retrace my steps, but it's not something that I um, would have picked. It's not, trust me, it's not. I mean, it's, it's um, my wife and I have a joke around here. It's a lonely post, because it is. Um, I had an email, interesting, uh, over the holidays, Rob, and someone wished uh, me and my staff a, a, a wonderful Christmas and a nice holiday. And I, I looked at my dog, Scooter, my little corgi, and I looked at my wife and I said, well, this is the staff right here, and Scooter doesn't do much except eat. So that's the end of that. And there is no staff. It's just me in front of my computer. I write. I talk like you. I mean, I'm, I'm in this thing, and it's... Uh, and I, and I watch. I mean, I look at news stories. I'm up at 6 o'clock in the morning and, and, and looking at uh, <clears throat> what's gone on while I've been asleep and try to post this stuff. But it, it is unnerving because of where, where we're going. And yet <clears throat> film 
and that's the reason why we moved into doing the watcher film. Um, people will watch a video today rather than read a book, and that's why, you know, I know you've been working on this uh, particular um, sci-fi series called Seed. Tell us a little bit about this. Where, what do you hope for this? Where do you, you know, maybe we've got a listener out there that's uh, worth millions and millions of dollars and doesn't know what to do with it, and they want to finance a movie. Tell us something about Seed. You can email me at rob at <laughs> <laughs> make check right available to payable to um, seed really goes way back for me uh, back when I was in fifth grade they were trying to shove evolution down my throat in school mm-hmm. and I raised my hand and I said um, if we came from monkeys how come there's still monkeys mm-hmm. and nobody could really give me a decent answer to that question and so I, I kind of pressed it every year, every year. And then between my junior year, uh, I mean, uh, junior high school, the, the, between eighth and ninth grade, uh, during that summer vacation, uh, I, I, I got into my freshman year of high school, and all of a sudden they stopped teaching it as the theory of evolution and started calling it evolution as a fact. And I thought, wow, it proved a lot over summer vacation, you know. Wow, it's just so amazing, just amazing. It, what a lie. It frustrated me to no end, and, and it really forced me to, to dive in because I was, uh, you know, a loner when it came to that in science class. You know, I was definitely in the minority. But, you know, to pass the test, I would have to answer the way the textbook, you know, how old is the Earth? Well, according to the textbook, 4.6 billion years, uh, despite the fact. So I'd always put, I'd have a kind of a caveat to that, to every answer. And and I kind of caused a lot of trouble in, in school uh, doing that, but I passed my grades because I answered the way the textbook said. But it got to the point by the end of the year that the students were listening more to me than they were listening to the teacher. Wow. And, and so I was always active in my church and everything, and so I uh, ended up getting, growing to a position of leadership within my youth group, and then after high school started teaching uh, Sunday school. And I started really diving into creation science, and, of course, as soon as you go into anything like that, you start studying a lot about the flood because there's really two schools of thought. Either everything happened gradually over millions of years or there was some catastrophic event that caused the Grand Canyon, you know. <laughs> and so um, I would study a lot of that stuff, and I was really involved with studying the, the mechanics of the flood, but I never really spent a whole lot of time thinking about the reason for the flood. And, you know, most people, I think, just kind of think, well, people were bad. Well, yeah, that's kind of just partially true. If you read Genesis 6, there's a lot of weird stuff going on, and Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be at the coming of the Son of Man. Well, you know, I'm sure most of your listeners, if not all of your listeners, would agree. You can take Matthew 24 and watch CNN for an hour and just kind of, it's like a checklist. Yep, there's that one, there's that one. (laughs) And um, so I've always kind of looked at it that way, but as I started to think more in terms of why the flood was created and looking at Genesis 6, it starts off with this strange little story about the sons of God, which I believe are the angels, um, came down to the daughters of men and created this creature called the Nephilim. And that was the beginning of the giants, both before and after the flood. Uh-huh. And so, you know, my mind started to kind of change a little bit about, okay, there's going to be some really weird stuff going on in, in the last days, you know, if, if this is true. And I kind of filed that away, didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it, until so my last missionary trip, or one of my last miss- missionary trips, was to Cyprus. And a lot of the missionaries on that side of the world were uh, called to that little island to have a missionary conference. So it was an opportunity for me to get a whole bunch of them in one place and get a whole bunch of stories out of them. And as part of that trip, I got to go to um, Greece. It was actually my second time going to Greece and to Athens. And uh, on the second trip, I really had a lot of time to myself to just kind of walk around, and I went through the marketplace where Paul had seen the altar to the unknown God, and you got the Acropolis and Mars Hill and all that. And what, what struck me was, like, literally, there wasn't anywhere I could look that I didn't see a centaur, a, a minotaur, a satyr, a, a broken-down temple, or some kind of representation of a god everywhere. And I thought to myself, man, nobody's going to remember Yoda 4,000 years from now. <laughs> you know, if all of this is just the, you know, the result of the imagination of a blind poet named Homer, there's no way these people are still going to have this in their collective consciousness 4,000 years later, you know? So I had this really heavy feeling like, you know, I think that stuff was real. And I came home, I told my wife about it, we had a nice talk about it, and I, I thought, you know, all those animal-human hybrids and stuff, the satyrs and all that, I think they were real. And we went to bed. Next morning, 
she wakes up, checks her email, and uh, my wife calls me in and shows me that there was a, a news article that had just come out. It was a BBC news report that showed that said uh, scientists had successfully cloned a sheep with a human heart. Wow. And, and it went on to go on and say, you know, if we keep doing this, uh, eventually the, the genes will fuse together and we'll end up with animal-human hybrids and there's going to be all kinds of ethical issues to deal with. And I'm Bingo. Like, we just talked about this last night. You know, and that really set things in motion. So I thought, bingo, that's confirmation right there. And I started really diving into researching this stuff. And, of course, you can't research any of that stuff and not find your way to two books in particular, a lot of others, but these two especially. And that's the book of Enoch and the book of Jasher. Fantastic. You know, Rob, that's just great stuff. It's a great little testimony you just gave there. And uh, we're at the bottom of the hour already. This is Acceleration Radio, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned. We'll be back at the other side of the break. Thanks for listening. Our guest tonight, Rob Skiba. Yeah, you, the one listening to the American Voice Radio Network. I know where you have been. I saw where you went out in the woods that day while you were hiding your food and ammo. I know where you go every day. I'm the government, and I'm here to protect you. Thanks to your GPS-enabled cell phone and the GPS devices we planted on your vehicles without a warrant, we can track and trace your every move. We are so glad you didn't buy a GPS jammer from thesignaljammer.com because you would have blinded us. And when the day came to round you up and steal your hidden goodies, we'd have to search high and low for you. So take my advice. Don't buy any GPS jammers and don't even think about buying any cell phone jammers from thesignaljammer.com because we want to know where you are. I got held up in the briars, and that's when I looked up and saw it. And it made no noise. The trees didn't move, or the leaves blew away. Ricky Sorrell, Stephen to the lights. I went into sort of a shock tailspin as I realized that the abductions were real. I said to myself, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, repeatedly for about six months. Dr. David Jacobs. They always communicated to me telepathically. An idea would come into my mind to go out and take pictures. Or they would have me start drawing symbols which was some type of language I had no knowledge of. They called it light language. The Alien Interviews is a hard-hitting expose conducted with 17 people who have had direct contact with the so-called extraterrestrial presence. The Alien Interviews is now available in paperback for only $10. Get informed as UFOs are real, burgeoning, and not going away. Go to lamarzuli.net. That's lamarzuli.net. And pick up your copy of The Alien Interviews www.lamarzuli.net Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzuli. This is Acceleration Radio. Our guest tonight, Rob Skiba. We are talking about um, how Rob got into uh, the up-and-coming sci-fi series called Seed. Rob, you were talking about two books, specifically the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jasher. Can you describe those a little bit for our audience and uh, tell us why those two books influenced you so much? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, let me just say that any time I've ever... I've, I've been a student of Scripture my whole life. My dad's a theologian. And I, like I said, I got saved when I was seven, so I've always been in the church and and Second Timothy two fifteen study to show yourself approved was my life verse growing up, and so I've always been in in the Word. And something that has always intrigued me as I've been in the Word is anytime I see a book mentioned in the Bible that's not in the Bible, 
I always like, well, where's that book, you know? And uh, so I've always been intrigued by that. And, and the scriptures itself says that uh, in the mouth of two witnesses, you can establish whether a thing is true or not. And one of the things I find interesting about the book of Joshua is that it is mentioned twice in the Bible. And, and one time in particular, it's, it's mentioned in a very interesting way. In the book of Joshua, it is mentioned, you know, a lot of people remember the story in the Sunday school or whatever when they first heard about Joshua commanding the sun to stand still. And uh, a lot of people think, well, that's, that's Scripture, you know. And yes, it's in Scripture, but Scripture says, is it not written in the book of Joshua that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still? Right. And, and so my position on that is I do believe that the, the Bible is a divinely inspired Word of God. And because I believe that, then, then the authors of all these books were, the Holy Spirit was talking to them, telling them what to write, you know. And here's this incredible, extraordinary event of, of Joshua actually commanding the sun to stand still. And, you know, if I understand my mechanics correctly, that basically meant, meant the earth stopped rotating, <laughs> you know. Uh, something happened. For, for that to take place, and it's a pretty extraordinary story. So what, what, what the Holy Spirit tells the author is say, hey, reference that book over there. That'll give you credibility, you know. And, so it's, and what's interesting about the, the book of Joshua itself is it's not a name. It's a word that means the true and upright or just account. So it's kind of like, you know, the author knew the book, and the audience that would be hearing or reading the book of Joshua was aware of that book. So under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God says, yeah, yeah, reference this book to give you credibility as you're writing this one. And so that's to me, well, if that's, if that's good enough for, for the Hebrews or who wrote the Scripture, well, why not, shouldn't it be good enough for me, you know? I'm going to go check this thing out. And when I first started looking into the book of Joshua with regards to the animal-human hybrid thing, you don't have to read very far into the book before you read uh, that one of the things that the Watchers taught men to do was the art of mixing one species with another. <laughs> there you go. It's right there. And in fact, I didn't get maybe a hundred pages into the book where and it's just written very matter of factly. Like this guy, this prophet loses his donkey. He's out looking for it, trying to find it. And he hears a weird noise in a cave and he looks and he sees a creature that, that the book describes as from the waist up is a human and the waist down is a goat. I'm going, well, that's a satyr. And, you know, the prophet kills the satyr and moves on. And it's kind of, it's just written like, yeah, I killed a horse, you know. Right, right. Very, like, everybody knows these things are out there, you know. And so that really intrigued me. And, and, and of course, as I started looking more into the Watchers and understanding all that, that obviously leads me to the Book of Enoch, which, uh, let me just say, from my understanding of the Book of Joshua, uh, it was never considered Scripture by the Hebrews, although they definitely held it in high regard, um, it's like most scholars today would reference the book of you know books or the works of Josephus as an authoritative historian of the first century. They seem to have referenced this book, you know, for when when looking at the time period between creation and the death of Joshua. So uh, held in high regard, but not necessarily considered scripture. However, the book of Enoch, you know, there's like over a hundred statements in the New Testament alone that find precedence in that book, and nowhere else. And Jude is a kind of a freaky, weird book anyway. It's a short book. Yes, it is. <laughs> most, most of the book of Jude is like a direct quote from from the book of Enoch, you know, and Peter quotes from it. And, you know, it's like, okay, if it's good enough for Peter and Jesus and Jude and these guys to be quoting it, well, maybe it's good enough for me to at least read it. And so, uh, of course, as soon as you dive into the book of Enoch, then it really just kicks the door wide open uh, to understanding what was going on in Genesis chapter 6 in the days of Noah. Yeah, I, I remember when I first read it, I never understood the flood. I never really grasped um, the understanding. Um, you know, I, I never, I just didn't understand the flood. And I remember I was about 10 years in the Lord then. I, I came to the Lord when I was 30, so it's around right around 1990, uh, probably a little bit before that, maybe 88. And um, I read Dr. I. D. E. Thomas's book, The Omega Conspiracy, and was just fascinated by it. And of course, began to look at his bibliography. And, and uh, one of my first purchases was the Book of Enoch. And I remember sitting down with the highlighter and just rereading and reading and rereading different passages with my jaw on the ground because it opened up a vista into the antediluvian world, the world before the flood. And all of a sudden, everything began to make sense. Now I got it. Now I understood the reason for the flood. Oh my gosh, that's what was going on. I mean, it's it's sort of the unthinkable 
but it's really true in my opinion and look we stand on the work of, of scholars like Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, Chuck Missler, Chuck Smith in the modern age, but Barnhouse, uh, M.R.D. Hahn, uh, going back a little further, C.S. Larkin, Pember, and then you've got the early church fathers all who knew and read um, and, and didn't believe it was, it was canonical, except for Tertullian, but everyone else pretty much you know, knew it, read it, and, um, and quoted from it often. So I, I'm with you. I think it's a real eye-opener. And uh, without the Book of Enoch, it, 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 it leads us down that road of the Sethite theory, which is a total torture of the text, in my opinion. And others, all those other authors that I mentioned also believe that the Sethite theory, which says that the sons of God were not the sons of God. Somehow they're the... The, the ungodly line of Cain and the daughters, it's just, it's just, it's total torturing the text. But when we plug in the book of Enoch, it becomes extremely clear. And as you said, the fact that Jude and Second Peter and First Corinthians lose to it, I mean, that, that's good enough for me. So that's, that's, you know, we're both on the same page there. Um, yeah, you know, one of the things you said, you, know, you nailed it, because uh, as I started reading, it's like if you take, of course, the Bible, take, take Genesis, Take Jasher, take Enoch, and put them all together. This this absolutely amazing story uh, is brought out, you know. And for me, for me, uh, it, it was the Rosetta Stone for understanding everything. It, it became like I never could understand. I, I, the Old Testament used to tweak me out, man. I got to be honest with you. I, I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't you read think? It well, well, there'd be like, and I think it's John fourteen. Philip says to Jesus, oh, show us the Father and it'll be sufficient, you know? And Jesus said, Philip, what are you talking about? You've been with me for three years you're, and you're asking me this? If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Well, that didn't compute. I, you know, like, tilt, tilt, you know, it's not working for me because I had this kind of good cop, bad cop view of God where, where Jesus was, you know, this kind, loving, you know, judge nobody except, incidentally, the religious people, um, healed everybody and just amazing. But here's this Old Testament guy who is like, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, kill, wipe out everything. And I'm like, how are these two the same? I, I couldn't, it just didn't compute until I got the picture that comes out of the combination of, of Scripture, Genesis, Joshua, and Enoch. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh, okay, I get it. Everywhere they were told to do that, those were Nephilim. Everywhere. Yes. yes. The, all the ites. Of you know the, the, of Canaan, yeah, the Hittites and the whoever-ites, right? The, right. <laughs> All of a sudden, man, everything came in the crystal clear focus, and I and I'm like, wow, this just everything makes sense to me now. And you know, regarding the the, I run into that. I guess everybody does that. That talks about the uh, the Nephilim and, and Genesis six runs into the Sethite view because unfortunately, it, it, it's taught in seminaries, so it's sure. You know, perpetuated in the pulpit everywhere, and so you start talking about it in church, and it was, no, no. I said, Look, Gen uh, Job 1.6, Job 2.1, Job 38.7, it talks about the sons of God presenting themselves in heaven. It's the exact same Hebrew terminology in the book of Job as it is in Genesis 6. And most of those same scholars will accept, yeah, these are the angels in Job. So it's like, well, how can you accept it in Job and not accept it in Genesis? And, and besides, since when do... Uh, two brothers, uh, you know, the offspring of two brothers, you know, I guess you would say cousins. Uh, it, w and when have you ever heard of cousins mating and getting 18-footers? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Og yeah. of Bashan, or, you know, or like yeah. Goliath, you know, nine or 12-footers. It just doesn't happen. And, and, I, and I certainly concur. It's just, I mean, it, it did the same for me when I, um, I, I had the same struggle exactly the same struggle that, that you had. I would look at Yeshua, Jesus, as, you know, my someone that I would give anything to hang out for just one day to watch him do what he did, anything. But the God right. of the Old Testament left me like, you know, like a homicidal maniac, you know. Right. I mean, that's what he seemed to me. It's like, what is this, kill everything? Like, like Joshua rides into... Um, Jericho and everyone's just slain instantly. I mean, like, where's the, there's no grace and mercy until you plug in the Nephilim. The moment we plug in the Nephilim and realize that there was a second incursion, and they were, I get into all this in the new book, my new book, which will be coming out hopefully in March, it, maybe in April, who knows, that's the way it's going. But it's called the Cosmic Chess Match, and it's all it does is show move, counter move, move, counter move. There's this war, this struggle going on, and the fallen one, the fallen cherub, as Russ Dizzer likes to call him, has not ceased the war, has not laid down. I mean, he won't get kicked out to Revelation 19, 19, 
1920. That's when the whole thing really starts to come down there. And we know he gets kicked out of the second heaven and comes down to earth. But, uh, you know, until then, this war has been, been fought on this planet for millennium. And he's been trying to um, screw up, if you will, the, the line of the Messiah. Um, certainly that was the, the first incursion. And it's, it's all throughout Scripture. I, I can't wait till I, you know, get it done. But but I hear you. The moment I plugged the book of Enoch, I just went, that's what's going on. It finally made sense to me. And this is what more, I think more churches really need to, you know, talk about this. Because this shows, the book of Enoch to me is almost like a like a battle report of the machinations of the fallen. Would you agree? Well, yeah. And what's amazing about the book of Enoch is as soon as you pick it up, it's like the first few verses, the first chapter. It says, this book is not for this generation, but for a future generation. And, you know, it, yeah. it just can't be a coincidence to me that, you know, here we got, okay, UFOs pop up in, you know, Roswell, New Mexico, 1947, and almost exactly a year later, a kid throws a rock in a cave and cracks a jar, and out pops the Book of Enoch again, you know, uh, for such a time as this. Well, and, and that's, is, I mean, isn't that interesting, that the fact that it was, it was so venerated that the, um, the Essenes... That's right you know, made sure that they, were, they had a copy of it. I mean, it's just amazing. We've got questions here, folks. If you want to get on the air tonight, um, you can shoot me an email at la at lamarzuli.net, la at lamarzuli.net. Or, of course, our lines are open, folks. Call us again at 800-596-8191, 800-596-8191, 800 Those numbers in El Monte and El Monte are the same. So, there you have it. We've got a, we've got a question to, from Aaron. Aaron, thanks for listening to Acceleration Radio. Appreciate your uh, patronage here. He, uh, Aaron writes, um, L.A., could you ask Rob to comment on any parallels, if any, that exist between giants portrayed in the Bible, Gnostic texts, and other various mythologies, i.e. Greek, Celtic, Norse, Hindu? Great question, Aaron. Rob, you want to take that? Yeah, I'm actually writing a... a I'll just, I don't want to get off track here. I'll, I'll stick to your question. But on well, that's December, okay. Have fun. <laughs> yeah, well, December 21st, uh, 2010, there was an extraordinary event happened, 2-2-2 in the morning from the 33rd parallel here in Dallas. Looked up and saw a blood-red moon floating over the shoulder over, over Ryan like a decapitated head. It just it totally flipped me out. And I, I was like, you know, there's so many things fell in the line for me. I started writing a blog, uh, but that blog very quickly turned into a book. And so I started having to separate it out into chapters and everything. So, uh, in fact, if you go to seedtheseries.com forward slash blog, uh, you'll see a, a, a menu. And, and I get right into it because uh, the first chapter is, uh, is what I call the Genesis 6 experiment. And it talks about what was going on there in Genesis 6. You know, the, 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 the first prophecy in the Bible is in Genesis 3 where God says to the devil that the seed of Eve will crush his head. So the devil says, okay, fine, I'm going to mess up the seed then. You know, three, three chapters later, you know, we got Genesis 6, the Genesis Bingo. 6 experiment. Bingo, right. And, and so that's where you get, as you call it, the first incursion. And it was so bad that, that literally, and, and some people who study, uh, you know, human reproductive rates, they say what today's rate is like 2.5 children per 80-year-old couple. You know, right. uh, I don't know what a point five child looks like, but that's what they say. And I'm, I think, okay, <laughs> well, they say if you apply the same statistics that we have today to the pre-flood world where people were living, you know, Methuselah 969 years, Adam 930 years, you know, uh, these guys are living 900 plus years, apply the same statistics, 2.5 children every 80 years, they estimate that by the time of the flood, the, the population of the earth, you want to talk about as it was in the days of Noah today, it was about 7 billion people. Wow. And so, you know, I mean, here's another parallel right there, 7 billion people at the time of the flood. But the difference was, at that time, everyone was corrupt by Nephilim genetics. I mean, if you look at the Hebrew, where it talks about Noah was found righteous in his generations, that's talking about the purity of his genetics. Absolutely. Where, where God's looking down at 7 billion people who have been corrupted, uh, he said, you know, everything that I had previously pronounced very good or good has now been messed up. And, and if it doesn't, if, if I don't intervene, nothing's going to survive, and certainly not my Messiah. So he preserves this one family. But what I found interesting as I dove into Enoch and Joshua, this brings me to the, to the caller's or to the person's question. Um, okay, if, if Noah was pure, and, and Joshua uh, tells you that Noah married 
the daughter of Enoch. And we know Enoch was pure. I mean, he was so pure, God took him <laughs> before he died. Right. Uh, so uh, it's reasonable to assume that his daughter would have been trained upright, you know, as well. So Noah marries Enoch's uh, daughter. And so uh, if Noah and his wife are pure, then by extension, obviously, Shem, Hem, and Japheth must have been pure also. But it doesn't necessarily mean that their wives were pure. And Joshua says that Noah chose three wives for his three sons from the brother of Methuselah, who is a guy named Eliakim. And, and Joshua makes a point of several times saying that everybody had, had fallen away. Even Lamech, Noah, Noah's father, had even fallen away. And so all these people had gone the way of evil except for Methuselah and Noah and his family. And then, of course, Methuselah dies off. So uh, if Eliakim... Methuselah's brother falls into the category of everybody who had gone corrupt, and using the same rationale, possibly his daughters could have been corrupt too, or at least one of them. And from my research, I believe that the wife of Ham definitely had some kind of genetic marker. I don't really see giants of any kind in the lineage of Shem or Japheth, but when you look in the lineage of Ham, man, you want to talk about parallels, first of all, the first one that's mentioned is Canaan. He's mentioned in Genesis chapter 9. Right. And there's this weird story where, you know, after the flood, Noah's drunk, he's naked. His son right. finds him naked. But then Noah curses his grandson. And, and, of course, Genesis just gives you that one sentence, you know, and you have no clue what any of that means or what's going on. People come up with all kinds of theories. I have my theory. Uh, I'll just throw it into the pile. Um, my theory is that, well, first of all, Canaan was present for Noah to have done that which means Canaan was either born on the ark or shortly after the flood. In any case, he was there because Noah cursed him. And my theory is that Canaan had six fingers and six toes. Wow. The reason I say that is because as you go further down the lineage of this guy, you find dudes that have six fingers and six toes. You know, that it's one of the characteristics of the Nephilim. And so I, I, I kind of envisioned that Noah looked down at his grandson, saw the six fingers and six toes, and said, oh, boy, here we go again you know, pronounce the curse over him, because that's the reason the whole world was just destroyed in the first place. Right, right. But clearly, we just mentioned it a little while ago, that all, it, if you look in the, the lineage of Canaan, there are the ites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, all the ites that Joshua and his boys had to wipe out when they came in from the Exodus. But it says they left, uh, they got pretty much all of them, except for the ones down in, in, in Gaza, down in Gath, and that, that area, the Philistines, where Goliath came from later, that David and his boys took out. Mm -hmm. So that's the lineage of Canaan. Uh, sort of, because when you look at the Philistines, you've got to go to a different son of Noah, uh, or of Ham, let me say, um, and that's Mizraim. Put, they don't really give a whole lot to, about Put's lineage. Ham had Miz, uh, Canaan, Mizraim, Put, and, and Cush. There's not much to go on with Put, but when you get to Mizraim, it says Mizraim, one of his sons, was a guy, was a guy by the name of Kaftor. Now, Kaftor is said to, in Genesis, to have been the father of the Philistines. Oh, okay, so there's your, your uh, Goliath and his boys. He's the father of those guys. Definitely. Well, it right. says Kaftor, Kaftor settled Crete. In fact, some translations call it the land of Kaftor. Other translations go ahead and translate it as Crete, because that's where he ended up. Well, what struck me when I saw that was, whoa, that's where all of Greek mythology comes from. All the Greek mythology originated in Crete. And that's where this guy's son settled. And the other thing, and, and we go early on in the Greek mythology, um, all of what we now call Europe used to have to pay tribute to this tiny little island in the Aegean Sea. And I was like, why? That's kind of strange. Well, it's not really strange if you consider people like Zeus and Hades and Poseidon might have been hanging out there. You know, that's where these guys originated from, and the scripture tells you. Israel's son, Kaftor. So, you know, that's where I see parallels. I, where it talks about Genesis 6, where it says, giants in the land in those days and also afterwards, and says, these were the great men of renown, the heroes of old. Right. I believe that's a statement referencing the great men of renown that we would call the Greek mythological people. And, you know, these guys went, continued to spread further north, and you start to realize a lot of these guys are actually all the same character. They just call them by different names. Uh, you know, the Romans call Jupiter. You know, the Greeks call him Zeus. Right. Maybe the Norse call them Odin, you know, whatever. But they, there's all these parallels that you see that just people have different languages. And that, of course, comes out of the Tower of Babel. From another interesting guy, <laughs> the son of Cush. 
I got a question here from uh, Richard. It's a really good question because we talked about the Book of Enoch, and we need to uh, delineate this. L.A., are there not several books of Enoch? Does Rob consider all of them to be legitimate? Great question, Richard. Mm -hmm. Thanks for listening to Acceleration Radio. Rob, want to take that? Uh, that is a good question, and, you know, I don't know that I'm the best authority to answer that, but, I, I, you know, I know there's the Ethiopian, there's the Slavic, and there's the first, second, and third. Uh, from what I understand, and you probably know more about this than I would, but second and third uh, may not be uh, as trustworthy as first, Enoch? Correct. That's, that, that's what I believe. Enoch 1 is the one that um, that is quoted in, in the book of Jude, and, and Second Peter refers to, and Paul alludes to. So that that's the one that I believe is um, the other ones get way far out. But Enoch yeah, one yeah. to me is the one that uh, you know makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I like the translation that I like is uh, the the author, um, uh, the compiler, whatever you want to call it, is Joseph B. Lumpkins, first and second books of Enoch, Ethiopian and Slavic texts with a comprehensive translation and commentary. Okay. He throws his own commentary in there, but. That's the that's the one I like to research. I've got the uh, R. H. Charles. Hold on, but I just I just purchased a. Let me see if I can reach with my headphones. Yeah, I can. Um, this is a complete exhaustive uh, edition. It's by R. H. Charles, but it's got all sorts of um, footnotes. It's 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 um, close to the 300 pages. It's just unbelievable, and I have it on my desk. I have not. Uh, look at it yet, but it, it's it's um, lots of commentary and, and footnotes, and it's, it's fascinating. So I'm I'm anxious to get into that, and probably will at some point. But yeah. um, we have another question. Let me take that here. Want to get on the show tonight? La at la marzuli dot net. La at la marzuli dot net. Not sure what you mean by this, Jason, but I'm going to ask it. Hey, La, quick question: Which authors are trusted to read? I know some are more New Age influence. God bless your fellow watchman in Christ. Um, I'm not sure. Rob, can you make sense out of that? Hey, LA, quick question. Well, Which authors are trusted if, to read? Yeah, it, well, if I in, interpret his question okay. uh, right, it, it's, uh, for me, as I started looking into this too, because you do, you, you'll find New Agers, you'll find all kinds of people out there that they all have their versions and takes and whatnot on these things. And, and I'll just tell you how I got started um, somehow, and I don't even remember how I how this happened, but I came across a package deal online that was from Tom Horn's uh, website. And he had a package deal that included the Nephilim Stargate book of his, the I.D.E. Thomas book. It's a 2008 edition uh, the, of the Omega Conspiracy. Right. Um, and, and I'm trying to remember what else, but it was like, a, it was a, like five. It, was a, a, it had CDs. It had um, the uh, Days of No Interview with Steve Quayle and this other one he did with Spencer Bennett. So it was like the, the CD and, and book package. And that's what launched me. And I, I think uh, by virtue of coming in from that gate, that led me to people like yourself, people like Russ Dizdar, you know, because, you know, you all kind of travel together. So uh, Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, of course, Patrick Heron and, and you know, these are the guys that, that I trust and, and that I've watched a lot of videos and listened to and, and read their books and stuff. So I don't know if that answers his question, but th that's the, the doorway that I entered through. <laughs> and that certainly makes sense to me. Um, I know Dr. I.D.E. Thomas was, like I said earlier in the show, that was the book that, that changed my life, literally. Um, I, sure. think, I think that was written in 86 or 76. I always get the two days confused. But... Um, it was it was written a while ago, and then Tom uh, Tom took it and reprinted it because it had gone out of print, and he got the rights from Dr. Thomas, and I sort of helped uh, helped that deal uh, coalesce. Uh, we had a meeting here in Los Angeles, and I bought Dr. Thomas and introduced him to Tom Horn, and uh, um, you know, but but Tom had already you know talked to him, and it was just Tom made the offer, and it, you know the rest is history. So, it, it, and that book needed to stay in print, and I thanked Tom for doing it, and. Getting it out there and uh, keeping the Book of Enoch out, or I'm sorry, keeping the Omega Conspiracy um, in the public eye is a really an important book. That's that book changed my life. I mean, I can't, yeah, I, I, I it, can't tell you how much that book changed my life. It it didn't uh, change my life per se, but it definitely opened my eyes significantly. I, I read both of them together. I read uh, 
Nephilim Stargates and Omega Conspiracy, and Tom references Omega Conspiracy a few times, I think, in that book, if I remember right. But anyway, like, I almost highlighted the whole thing to the point where a friend of mine said, what'd you buy? Well, why highlight if you're just going to highlight the whole page? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like, my whole book's yellow, you know? Just loved it, man. Well, folks, we're at the top of the hour. This is Acceleration Radio. We're uh, plumbing the depths of a Nephilim, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasher. Dr. I.D.E. Thomas's book, Tom Horn stuff, and uh, reference a lot of a lot of different authors. Want to get on the show tonight, folks? Shoot me an email, la at lamarzuli dot net, or give us a call, 800-596-8191. This is Acceleration Radio. I am your intrepid host, L.A. Marzuli. Hang it right here, folks. We'll see you at the other side of the break. makes deep sea salt from France so different. Up from the ocean depths in the south of France flow undersea rivers of pristine sea water. At high tide, the prepared salt ponds are filled with this water. Over spring and summer, processed only by ocean breezes and sunshine, the brine thickens and salt crystals float to the top. These are harvested with nets and deposited on wooden drainage flats to dry. The salt is then gathered up, packaged, and shipped around the world. This salt is much more than a box of lifeless sodium chloride. Soldiers worth their salt were once paid with this valuable commodity. It contains 78 to 84 balancing elements. This is living salt, and once you have tasted it, you will never go back to anything else. I've seen this salt in gourmet shops for $30 a pound. Get it now at 4spectrum.us for under $8 a pound. Order 10 pounds and enter the coupon code AVRSALT at checkout and save $20. Ships free to your door or call 800-581-8906. Order today. I got held up in the briars and that's when I looked up and saw it. And it made no noise. The trees didn't move or the leaves blow away. Ricky Soro steered into the lights. I went into sort of a shock tailspin as I realized that the abductions were real. I said to myself, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, repeatedly for about six months, Dr. David Jacobs. They always communicated to me telepathically. An idea would come into my mind to go out and take pictures, but they would have me start drawing symbols, which was some type of language I had no knowledge of. They called it light language. The alien interviews is a hard-hitting expose conducted with 17 people who have had direct contact with the so-called extraterrestrial presence. The Alien Interviews is now available in paperback for only $10. Get informed as UFOs are real, burgeoning, and not going away. Go to lamarzuli.net. That's lamarzuli.net. And pick up your copy of The Alien Interviews, www.lamarzuli.net. American Voice Radio Network is heard on Galaxy 19 at 97 degrees west, transponder 23, frequency 12115, audio PID 2595. AVR is heard on the left side audio channel, and AVR2 is heard on the right side audio channel. Remember, both AVR and AVR2 are on Galaxy 19. Same network, double the choices. show in our time slot on the internet, Acceleration Radio, although tonight we have flipped down to number two. I am bummed. 
And Mike Savage is way ahead of us tonight in the second hour. So I don't know whether we're going to catch him or not. We'll have to wait and see. We have a caller, uh, Paul from California. Paul, welcome to Acceleration Radio. Thanks for listening. And I assume you have a question for our guest, Rob Skiba. I sure do, uh, L.A. Uh, Rob, I wanted to ask you, in Genesis um, 6-2, where it says, were the sons of God, were they the angels that fell with Lucifer, or were they 200 watchers corrupted by their own lust for the daughters of men? Great you know, that's a, yeah, it is a great question. I've always kind of lumped them in as part of the one-third, uh, and mainly because of uh, Genesis chapter 3, um, when, when God told the devil that Eve's seed was going to crush his head. My, my thinking was he launched a, a platoon out of the one-third and said, okay, let's try this little Genesis 6 experiment. So my, my feeling has always been that it was part of the one, uh, part of the one-third and the reason for that, and I have to give credit to David Flynn for this, but uh, the location where the 200 that you mentioned landed was Mount Hermon. And, and David Flynn has done some amazing work on this and, and determining, and you can go on Google Earth and check it for yourself, but sure enough, the center of the mountain range that is known as Mount Hermon is located at 33.33 degrees north by 33.33 degrees east from the Paris Prime Meridian, which used to be the the true prime meridian until they changed it, which is also known as the Devil's Line. So they, they landed on the only geographical location that fits their number, 33.33, is the same as one-third. One-third is 33.33 percent. And so, again, that's part of the reason uh, why I believe that they were part of uh, the one-third that fought, fell with Lucifer. Okay, um, I got another question for you, if it's okay. okay. Um, sure, go ahead. wanted to talk about the Nephilim. Okay, because... Um, there, I guess when the flood came and destroyed their bodies, yeah. they now, since they're part angel, part human, now, do, some folks have said that they don't have a soul. And if they don't have a soul, then how can they be an intelligent spirit being? My, well, uh, I, my belief is that they do. I don't know what that looks like, but what, what happened, my understanding of the demons is that the demons are the Raphaim. The Raphaim are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Uh-huh. So from from that perspective, I, they don't have a, well, we've had a lot of debate about this, whether or not they have a, quote, redeemable spirit. I, I'm of the position that I don't think that they do, um, because God doesn't show these guys any kind of mercy throughout the whole Bible. So, uh, you know, uh, if, if they had some kind of redeemable spirit, then God would redeem them. But the book of, um, uh, of uh, Enoch goes into detail and talks about that specifically that uh, I don't know if I could find it real quick, but it says that uh, that that's what they shall be known as evil spirits. Oh yeah, here we go. It's uh, the book of Enoch, chapter fifteen, uh, verses six through the end of the chapter. Uh, it says, and the, now the giants who are produced from the spirits and flesh shall be called evil spirits on the earth, and they shall live on the earth. Evil spirits have come out from their bodies. And it goes on and talks about you can read for yourself. But uh, So I believe that the Raphaim are what we would call the demons, which are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. Hey, Paul, thanks for calling yes. in. Do you have anything else since I hey, got you on the phone your here? Guest, um, taking this question. Appreciate all the work you guys are doing to get this out so folks can really understand it. Well, the pleasure is ours. Well, thanks for calling in, Paul. Appreciate it. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the Mount Hermon deal, and um, it's, that's always fascinated me, and all with all you know accolades to David Flynn because he's the guy that makes the connection uh, between yeah. Mount Hermon and, and Roswell, and of course that paper just stood the entire UFO community on its head when he wrote it a few years back. Ooh. Yeah, just amazing, yeah. and um, I actually gave it. I was interviewed on the Ancient Alien program this this season, and gave that information to them and and asked them, begged them. You know, and and did it on camera. Referred to David Flynn, and of course, none of that. They they used that, um, but they didn't they didn't mention David Flynn's name, which is you know shame on them. Anyway, people can do what they're going to do. But but here's my question to you, Rob. Um, in a previous conversation, where well, you just mentioned that, uh, that you had gone to Mount Hermon in 2005, what impressed you the most about that site? Well, I. If, if this is the first thing I would say to anybody out there who's a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to go at least one time to the Holy Land, to Israel. Uh, it's, first of all, it's such a small country that everywhere you go, you're standing where something happened, <laughs> you know. 
And, and one of the most profound places where I stood on my trip to Israel in 2005 was in Caesarea Philippi. Huh. And that is at the base of Mount Hermon, and that is the location where Jesus, at the end of his ministry, he brings his disciples there, and he asks the question, who do men say that I am? Oh, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets, whatever. And then Peter says, you, know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and I never understood this passage of Scripture, because Jesus gets so excited about Peter's answer. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, and the gates of Hades aren't going to prevail, and he goes on and on and on. I'm like, why is he so excited about this is the end of his ministry? I mean, from the day he was born, people told him he was the Son of God. I mean, as soon as he went to the Temple Mount, you know, the, the, the prophets told him that when he's 12 years old, everybody kind of like, whoa, something going on here. When, when, when he got baptized, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. Every time the demons saw him, they shrieked and said, You are the Son of God. He told him to be quiet. You know, he picks Nathaniel, and Nathaniel says that he was the Son of God. And he said, Why? Because I saw you under the fig tree. You know, so people call him the Son of God his whole life. So why is it such a big deal when Peter said it? And I never could understand that until I stood in the spot where that conversation took place. And, of course, as a filmmaker, the way I envision it, you know, if I was shooting the scene, I see Jesus, because at the base of Mount Hermon in Caesarea Philippi, there is what is called the the, uh, altar of Pan, who was a satyr. Now, and it's kind of like Petra, you know, it's kind of like this embedded in 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 the rock. Now, I envisioned Jesus with his back to the altar of Pan. What's interesting is, is that Pan is the Greek god of shepherds. So <laughs> it's very poetic that the good shepherd stood in front of the Greek god of shepherds and he asked this question. And I see Peter looking at Jesus and kind of Jesus surrounded by his disciples, and they're all saying different things. And I see Peter kind of thinking to himself, going, you know, the rabbi always asks us rhetorical questions. He knows who we think he is. Why is he asking this? And I almost see like a rack focus, where, where Peter's looking at Jesus, and all of a sudden Jesus goes out of focus, and Pan comes in focus. And then Pan goes out of focus, and then Jesus comes back into focus, and Peter goes, I get it. Oh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah, that's right, Peter. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm the Son of God, right? Not, not these, and, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church, and not the rock behind me. And oh, by the way, six days later, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the top of a high mountain. Well... Mount Hermon is by far the highest mountain in the region, and they're in the area anyway, so most scholars believe that Jesus took them to the top of Mount Hermon. And I believe that, too. There's, there's a cross on the top of Mount Hermon where people for, through the centuries have believed that that's maybe the spot of the Transfiguration. What's interesting today is that there's a U.N. radar outpost there, so it kind of <laughs> makes me wonder, hmm, what, what are they looking for? <laughs> now, granted, it's, it's on the border of, of Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. It's a very you know, tenuous location. Um, but back down to the bottom of the mountain, when you're, if you're looking at the altar of Pan, off to the left is a location that to this day is still called the Gates of Hades. It's, a, it's an opening in the, in the rock, and they believe that that was the ancient Gates of Hades. Off to the right, as you're looking at the altar of Pan, if you look to the right, there's a foothill at the base of Mount Hermon. At the top of the foothill is a place called the Fortress of Nimrod, one of his fortresses, I guess. And so when Jesus takes his disciples to the top of this high mountain, he could literally look over to the spot where the 200 uh, Genesis 6 experiment platoon landed. (laughs) He could look over at Pan, the animal-human hybrid abomination. He could look over at the gates of Hades, which I have always maintained is not just a place, it's a person. Hades is the brother of Zeus. He he guards that deal, you know. Uh, And then he could look over at Nimrod, the first Antichrist, to try to create a one-world system without God. In fact, tried to kill God, if you look at the narrative of, with regard to the Tower of Babel. So I think it's incredibly interesting that Jesus took his disciples there. And now, you take the revelation that Peter or, uh, David Flynn had about the location, 33 by 33, and then you flash forward, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be the coming Son of Man, to Roswell, New Mexico, which is on the 33rd parallel. And if you take that location and multiply it by the universal constant of pi, it gives you the longitude, which is 104. I, my personal belief is that what was called, you know, uh, Nephilim activity, fallen angel activity, watcher activity back in Genesis 6 has just been repackaged into what we call alien graves or alien abduction activity. And I, uh, Rob, I want to interrupt you real quick. I completely concur with that. Completely, 100% concur. It's been repackaged, and it, I call it the coming great deception. And it's here, and it's, uh, you know, the enemy is, is not an idiot, and he's, he's failed with 
the first and second incursion. It didn't work. So he's trying right. something else. I, I get into some of this in, in uh, you know, the book that's coming out. But, but please continue. Are you done with that answer? Should I let you go on a little further, or should I bring a caller in? Uh, no, I'm good with that. Uh, okay. But one of the things I just wanted to bring up was, uh, I don't know if uh, you had posted it anywhere on your website or anything, but if you go to, to seedtheseries.com, there's a trailer. And, and it's just a little animated trailer I put together. We haven't shot. It's going to be live action. I, this is more like a concept animation. Uh, I just did it animated because we didn't have the budget to go shoot it for real. But there's a scene in, the, in that little three-minute trailer that has this creature in it that, that – uh, one of the characters refers to this creature as Azazel. And something that has always intrigued me as I've gotten into the book of Enoch is of the 200 an fallen angels that landed on Mount Hermon, 20 of them are named as kind of like the captain captains over these 200. And one that is named the worst of all of them is Azazel. Now, in the narrative in the book of Enoch, God tells the archangel Raphael to bind Azazel and bury him in a place called Dudiel, and to ascribe all sin to Azazel. And the Jews, even to this day, still have a, a strong understanding of this. In fact, that, that name appears in some English translations, but in the original language, uh, in Leviticus, I believe it's chapter 16, but don't quote me on that, but it's in Leviticus where they, the Jews sacrifice a lamb for sin, and they would lay their hands on the scapegoat, and it says, send the scapegoat out to Azazel. Well, if you all you read is Leviticus, you have no clue who or what Azazel is. Uh, but the Book of Enoch tells you exactly who he is. And so I got to thinking, and that's one of the major plot points of, of Episode 1 that launches my character on his journey, is in 2002 I've got uh, this military unit poking around the desert of Iraq looking for weapons of mass destruction, and they inadvertently come across the cave of Dudiel, and almost release Azazel, but all hell break, breaks loose for this platoon of, of army soldiers. Uh, but that's what that character is all about right there. So what I'm trying to do with the TV series is, okay, uh, like you said, not a lot of people are reading books right now. They, the church is not talking about this. You know, there are more and more people are finding radio programs and, and blogs like what you have and, and others. Sure. But uh, my feeling is to get to the masses, there's nothing better than a science fiction series. And the reason for that is because people go into science fiction suspending their disbelief. And so if I've already got your disbelief suspended, then you're open to believing whatever I've got to tell you. And now I'm in the perfect position to start seeding all of this information that we're talking about, but doing it in a way that's not preachy, it's not going to be like left behind or anything. You're not going to hear any guy saying, the Bible says, you know, in a terrible um, southern accent, <laughs> like most Christian films are. This is written from a biblical <laughs> worldview. It's going to be written from a biblical <laughs> worldview, but it's, it's definitely going to be served on a secular palette because that's my audience. And, and I think Christian filmmakers, one of the mistakes they make is they're always trying to preach in a venue that people go to be entertained. And it, it's, it's not very effective, in my opinion. So, and, and I'm going to be going up against shows like V, like The Event, like Fringe, you know, all these shows that are out there right now, that would essentially be more or less our competition. Um, but we're going to be dealing with a lot of the similar uh, subject matter, but attacking it from a totally different angle than anybody else has ever attacked it. That's fascinating. We got a caller from uh, David from South Carolina. David, how are you tonight, sir? Good night, gentlemen. And uh, uh, it's great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, L.A., for taking my call. Absolutely. And, uh, sir, I missed the first 10 minutes of the show, so could you give me your name again? His name is Rob Earth Skiba. Last. Rob Skiba is our guest. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, uh, with my terrible southern accent. So. <laughs> <laughs> it does, just don't go we, to Bible. We, we, we love your southern accent. <laughs> wait, wait. Give, us, no, give, man, it, give, give it to us once. Go ahead. Say, the Bible says... <laughs> Yeah, I believe me, I live down here. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, I had one question, and, I, and then I got a comment. Uh, well, anyway, I've been rescued through faith, and it, it helped in the fact that uh, I listened to LA show one night, and I called in and I spoke with a, a gentleman, and uh, you know, I, I decided to redeem my faith, and uh, everything went. Amen. It, it's going very well for me now. That's today. great, David. Glad to hear But um, let's see. My little brother, he's still... Uh, we've had experiences, okay? Sure. And uh, 
you know, it's, it's a family. I don't know, it's been going on for quite some time. And uh, throughout, uh, at least from my grandfather. And uh, I just want to ask you, uh, do you have, uh, let's see, definition of the fact that uh, if uh, someone is had to interact with these Nephilim, mm -hmm. which I do consider to be giants, uh, and I have seen them before, but um, do you uh, consider that to be corrupting influence to the to the to the point where you you get so deep into it you cannot escape that? I'm not sure I understand the question. You're saying if if you you study it too much, you get too deep into it, or no? I mean the actual. I the last time I was. Uh, it, involved with something like that. It was a mothership, and uh, that, that's what I was told. And uh, since then, I uh, was able to get away from that. Oh, so you're talking about, okay, so you're talking about a, a real uh, abduction experience. Yeah. 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 Uh, L.A. could probably feel this one better than I can. I know you've dealt with this, but, you know, I, I heard L.A. once say, rebuke first, ask questions later. Yeah. You know, David, David, one, one thing, um, you know, we talked about this over the air. Um, may I make a suggestion? And, and anybody who's coming out of this, what, what, we need, what we need to tell you is that you need to um, put in new information. You need to read the Word. You need to understand your authority in Christ. You need to understand that you're a new creature in Christ. And, and you need to kind of move away from any involvement with this stuff for a while. In other words, I mean, I wouldn't even listen to my show. I really wouldn't. I, I really mean that. Because in this show, we talk about the very stuff that you've been involved in. What you want to try to do is break that connection and move as far away from you as you can from it and get healed up and get strong. In other words, when I, when I became a Christian, and I, I don't want to, you know, spend a lot of time on this, but I will spend some time on it because I think it's, you know, you're a caller and you need to know. But, but I, I, and I'm writing about this. This is my testimony in, in my new book, The Cosmic Chess Match, which will come out in March or April. But my testimony is simply this. My girlfriend died when I was 18. She was 16, all right? And that led me on a quest. And I was involved in the New Age and in gurus from the time I was 18 to 30. And then I, became, then I came to the Lord. Well, the first three years, it was boot camp. And I mean that. It was spiritual boot camp. I didn't associate with anything that I had done before. I just renounced everything, completely renounced everything that I had been into and walked away from it and, and reprogrammed myself. And I mean programmed myself by the washing of the Word. I, I was in the Word. I went to every Bible study I could. I can't, I can't stress that enough. I just sat and listened and served. That was it for three years. That's all I did. Then, in 88, 1990, then I was brought sort of back into it. But see, that had been like eight to ten years, and it was slowly. Now it's like 30 years ago, and this is what I do full time. And, but the Lord has slowly raised me back up to where now I can talk about it and not be affected by it anymore. So my counsel to you, my good friend, is, and I really mean this, I wouldn't listen to this show. I really wouldn't. I would, you know, maybe a year or two from now, whatever, that's fine. But you need to soak up the word, put that into your head, you know, and pray and get into a good church. Does that make sense, David? Okay, I think we lost. I'm not sure what, what happens with that, but let's um, let, let's we have a question here from Michael Rob. Yeah. Um, wow, great show! A lot of what he's saying is striking home. Listen to Mr. Listen, listening to Mr. Skeever sounds like my own testimony to a T. From filmmaking to school and college, which is where I am, my favorite verse is Proverbs three, there's five six, and I created an apologetic website ministry several years ago. Okay, thank you, Michael. Anyway, my question for Mr. Skeever is. What he thinks about Roswell being located exactly opposite of Mount Hermon, where the fallen angels first came down. Great question. Um, yeah, know. it is. And that feeds into uh, the blog series that I'm writing right now. And, you know, let me just say before I say anything else, please do not question my patriotism. Um, I am a third generation Army veteran. My dad was in Vietnam, grandfather was in World War II. I was in during Desert Storm. Fortunately, never had to serve, but volunteered three times to go. I love my country. However, 
Having said that, I have come to the realization that this country may be very instrumental in bringing about the what I would call the resurrection of the Antichrist, and that's in my blog series. And, and I believe that is going to be accompanied by Nephilim spiritual activity. Um, and so I believe that this country was actually founded. Chris Pinto has done a lot of great videos on this. He's got a documentary called The New Atlantis. I would recommend you check it out. Uh, that this country was actually founded with the express purpose of bringing about the end times. And so I think Roswell, New Mexico, is the perfect place for it to land. <laughs> yeah, that's. I, I saw Chris's um, presentation last April, and it was very, very chilling. i got a question here from Mario. Um, some of the dinosaurs look grotesque, and they weren't allowed into the ark. Is it yes. possible some of the dinosaurs were tinkered with by the fallen angels? Mm -hmm. That it's so funny that that person wrote that because right after I came back uh, from that trip to Cyprus and had the conversation my, with my wife about the animal-human hybrid deals, um, shortly after that conversation and after reading, beginning to read Joshua, I got hired to do a freelance job in Pennsylvania, and in Philadelphia I had gone to a uh, I think it's the Benjamin Franklin Museum. And they had an IMAX theater there, and the, the movie that they were playing was Dinosaurs of the Deep, monsters, dinosaurs and stuff of the ocean. And I'm watching this documentary, and it's top-notch, you know, in, in, in IMAX, you know, so it's pretty amazing. But I'm looking at these horrific creatures. These, these just, they're nothing but carnage, you know, makers. That's what these guys do. They just tear everything up and eat everything right, up. Right, right, right. And, and that's the ocean version, you know, and they had land versions, too, you know, like T-Rex and whatnot. And I'm thinking to myself, as I'm watching this movie, I'm, I'm like, I don't believe God created that. I'm not denying that it was here. I believe that the fossil record t tells us it was here. But I kind of added that to the theories I was already working on and thought, you know what, I bet you man, through the influence of the fallen angels, tinkered with existing creatures on this planet, lizards or whatever, and created these monsters. Which, again, brings us to today, and, you know, Tom Horn's got his book that just came out, Forbidden Gates, and some of the stuff that scientists are doing right now, I'm like, yeah, we're about to create some pretty horrendous monsters now, just as it was in the days of Noah. So my personal feeling is that a lot of these dinosaurs, especially the most ferocious ones, were, in my opinion, created by uh, fallen angel technology. Uh, we've got another caller online, not sure who this is, but um, why don't you give us your name and welcome to Acceleration Radio. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Michael from Virginia. Hey, Michael. How you doing, man? Hi, Michael. Uh, doing good. Uh, frequent blogger on your site. Uh, go by Faithful Elect there, if you remember me. Okay, uh, I do. Yeah, I, yeah. thank you. Hi, Faithful Elect. <laughs> uh, my, uh, my question, you know, this, this goes back uh, for many years. Uh, my great aunt told me this growing up. Her uh, is a close cousin, but a lot older. He was in the military somewhere in the Middle East, and I want to say Israel, but I don't. I'm not real sure if that's correct. Well, uh, well, he was over there. He said that uh, someone in, or had somehow gotten a word around that they knew sort of the location of where Moses might possibly have been buried or whatever. Mm. So they go climbing, and he says he gets to this point uh, on this mountain or wherever it's at, and he's he's not able to go any further. And he says he's no longer able to even walk backward. He just, Whoa. like, fear, you know, uh, paralyzed him. Yeah. And uh, he said he had to pray and pray. He just said, Lord, if you just let me get up, I won't try to go any farther. Now, he never knew for sure if that's, you know, the actual side or anything. But, you know, it always kind of, you know, made him wonder. <laughs> I was sure. just wondering your all's thoughts about, you know, something like that. Well, that's an incredible story. Um, is he around? Can I... Is it possible to talk uh, to him? No, but she is. <laughs> I'm sorry, is she around? Is it possible to talk to her? She had a uh, bad car wreck, and uh, she's, she had to be on uh, a lot of oxygen. And my wife's a retired nurse, but it was just, you know, she couldn't take care of all her special needs. So she's in a nursing home pretty close by, though. Wow. And I could sort of let her talk to you <laughs> by getting a phone to her one day. Okay, Faithful Elect, email me on that on the blog tomorrow. Rob, we got a minute before okay. the break. What's your, what's your thoughts there? Well, that wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, it says the devil himself was trying to get to the body of <laughs> of Moses, and Michael had to contend with the devil, you know, uh, over that, and the devil, uh, Michael rebuked the devil. And I believe that Michael is the guardian archangel uh, over the nation of Israel. So it wouldn't surprise me if somebody's out there maybe getting too close that Michael might thump him out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, guys. Hey, thanks thank for the call. This is uh, Acceleration Radio, folks. 
Thanks for listening. It's been a, 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 a real quite a wild ride tonight. Lots of different topics, uh, lots of different questions. If you've got a question, email me at la at lamarzuli.net, la at lamarzuli.net, or shoot us a call, 800-596-8191. That number again in El Monte and El Monte, 800-596-8191. Eh? <laughs> we'll see you on the other side of the break, folks. Can your family survive a food shortage lasting two weeks, six months, or maybe longer? Sound far-fetched? We live in precarious times. There is an ever-increasing possibility of food shortages caused by terrorist attacks, natural disasters, truck strikes, or monetary collapse. You owe it to yourself and family to prepare, and you can by getting a supply of our long-storing, freeze-dried, and dehydrated foods. Our foods are time-tested to store for decades, require a minimum of time and energy to prepare while maintaining superior nutritional value, freshness, and taste. Our foods were designed designed for the space program and are in constant use today by our own nuclear submarine service. Contact the Freeze Dry Guy today at Freeze Dry Guy at Lancet.com. That's Freeze Dry Guy at L A N S E T dot com or call 530-265-8333. 530-265-8333 and let them know you heard it on American Voice Radio. There are nine kinds of water. Hard water, raw water, boiled water, salt water, rain water, snow water, filtered water, deionized water, and distilled water. Only one of these kinds of water is good for you. Distilled water is water which has been turned into vapor so that all its impurities are left behind. Then, by condensing, it is turned back to pure water. It is the only water which is pure. The only water free from all impurities. The choice is clear. Dr. Alan E. Bannock. Order your tabletop water distiller for $139.99. Post paid. It comes with everything you need to get pure distilled water. Go to superstore.theamericanvoice.com. That's superstore.theamericanvoice.com. Order now. I got held up in the briars, and that's when I looked up and saw it, and it made no noise. The trees didn't move, or the leaves blew away. Ricky Sorrell, Stephen for Lights. I went into sort of a shock tailspin as I realized that the abductions were real. I said to myself, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, repeatedly for about six months, Dr. David Jacobs. They always communicated to me telepathically. An idea would come into my mind to go out and take pictures, but they would have me start drawing symbols which was some type of language I had no knowledge of. They called it light language. The Alien Interviews is a hard-hitting expose conducted with 17 people who have had direct contact with the so-called extraterrestrial presence. The Alien Interviews is now available in paperback for only $10. Get informed as UFOs are real, burgeoning, and not going away. Go to lamarzuli.net. That's lamarzuli.net. You pick up your copy of the Alien Interviews www.lamarzuli.net Savage is way out in front. I'm your intrepid host, L.A. Marzulli. This is Acceleration Radio. Hey, folks, what does um, Prophecy of the News, the Prophecy Club, and Radio Liberty have in common? I'll tell you what. They're all buying Watchers DVD and selling it in their ministries, selling it on their shows. Uh, what does uh, Dirk Vanderplug say about the, uh, the Watchers DVD? Well, to begin with, it is one, if not the best video documentary that I have ever seen. So, Look, folks, I'm not making this stuff up. We sell these things all the time. Um, We get orders all day long from people all over the world, Israel, Ireland, 
South America, Australia. I might make them this stuff up. Talk to Jane and Shipping. She'll back me up on this. Uh, we're getting orders from all over the planet to get this Watchers DVD. It's got some startling footage of cow mutilations, alien implants, and of course, um, people that have seen craft and, and talk about it uh, right on camera is it, fascinating. But the part, the parts that we focused, my, my good friend and, and co-producer and director, Richard Shaw and myself, uh, focused on were the cattle mutilations and the implants because that, in our opinion, is a smoking gun. You can't get around that. There are, that's real, physical, tangible evidence. We've got a question here from, so if you want to check that out, folks, go to lamarzuli.net, lamarzuli.net, pick up a copy of Watchers. I'm telling you, you can sit down and show that to your family, and it will kick off discussions like you can't believe. This is from Joan, Joan Hawkeye. Thanks for listening. Joan, haven't heard from you in a while. Glad you're still listening to Acceleration Radio. She writes, hello, Dr. Marzuli. And remember, it's an honorary doctorate, folks, uh, so it's not the real deal. But I'm very proud to have it. Does Mr. Skiba believe a Nephilim are alive and amongst us today? <laughs> there's the 64th. Uh, there's the elephant in the room question, Rob. Do they know yeah. who they are and where they are? Yeah, well, if we define the Nephilim as the angel-human hybrid offspring, then yes, I do believe that they are among us. Um, I believe you bring that out quite a bit, actually, in your yeah. In your watcher yeah. uh, DVD, um, the the difference being uh, they were pretty overt in a couple of things. First of all, you know it says that they essentially married the women in Genesis six, but Daniel chapter two says that they shall not cleave one to another, and I, and that's kind of a marriage term right there. So it's basically they're just raping and taken right now. So there's one difference right there. But the other thing is I think that they are uh, they've gotten a lot better. Um, at making us look more normal, uh, making the, the Nephilim, I should say, look more like us. Uh, Dr. David Jacobs talks about that, too, is that, you know, through repetitive uh, genetic tampering, they're, they're trying to get to, or I believe they already have, got to the point where, where they've been able to produce offspring that aren't 18-footers like Og or 12-footers right. like Goliath, but rather a 6-footer that looks like you and me, but could very well be a, a totally... Uh, genetically engineered Nephilim. I, I completely concur with what you're saying. We've got another caller, Richard from New York. Richard, thanks for listening to Acceleration Radio. Welcome to the show, and I assume you have a question or comment. Hi, how are you, L.A.? First, I'd like to uh, thank you for your show. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, it's a great time and place where like-minded individuals can get together. Uh, Rob, uh, yeah. also going to lift you up in prayer for thank that you. your needs are met. For as far as anything concerning finances and the immediate for your production of seed. Uh, also, I do have a little question. I'm going to try and keep it brief. Uh, I was uh, on your blog talk a little bit today, uh, running by you, uh, a little talking a little bit about Yeshua. Oh, yeah. How each individual letter uh, has actually yeah. at least two meanings. If you could just elaborate on that a little bit, I'd greatly appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Good to, good to hear from you <laughs> again. Um, yeah, uh, it's one of the things, that the revelations that I had as I've been writing Seed, is, and I'm actually writing a chapter of my book that's going to be called Jesus by the Numbers, because there's so many things. Jesus said he came to destroy the works of the devil, and so many things that he did right down to the numbers. I mean, I always wondered why he didn't really do anything with his life that we're aware of until he was 30, and then he died at 33 after a three-year ministry and was dead for three days. Three, 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 three. You know, so I'm like, man, you know, there's all these crazy parallels. He sends the seventy out. You know, you got the seventy demons that come out of the Tower of Babel. There's all these crazy parallels. And as I was studying all of that, and, and as soon as you start looking into the Tower of Babel and looking into Nimrod and everything, you you instantly find yourself in the world of Osiris, which leads you into the All Seeing Eye, which leads you into the Illuminati. My personal opinion is that, uh, that we are the body of Christ, uh, is, is the venue through which God works on this earth. He works through people here on earth, uh, his bride, his body. Now, we're, if I can use this terminology, we're a decapitated body right now. Jesus is the head, and he's in heaven. We're the body, we're here on earth. Well, the antithesis of that is your pyramid with the cap that hasn't come down yet. It's also, if you look at this, why the, the event of December 21st, 2010, freaked me out so much with that moon floating like a decapitated head because Nimrod was decapitated, according to the book of Joshua, by Esau. And so you, you've got these two competing 
people out there. Nimrod also, by the way, uh, through Os- his incarnation as Osiris, is the only other god of antiquity besides our god that was referred to as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And his symbol is the Ankh, which is a cross. There's so many similarities, it just gets ridiculous the more you look into it. So if the church or the body of Christ is the venue through which God works, then the devil always has a counterfeit of everything God does. And I believe that the venue through which the devil works, the organization, if you will, uh, is the Illuminati. And so you've basically got the church versus the Illuminati. And what's interesting about the Illuminati is that all of their symbolism and everything associated with them always points to that stupid all-seeing eye that's on the back of our dollar bill. And as I started, uh, I got involved with the Torah Club and started diving in and understanding our Hebrew roots of our faith and everything, and, and uh, studying Hebrew, and, and my wife actually, uh, through a friend of mine, pointed this out, but every letter in Hebrew has multiple meanings, just the letters themselves. They also have numerical value. And so when you combine letters to make a word, not only does the word have the meaning of the word itself, but it also has the combined meaning of the letters that comprise the word. And when you look at Jesus' real name, which is Yeshua, and you read right to left, the letters translate out to the hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. I was like, Hoo-hoo! Wow, that's amazing. How I, cool is that? I've, I've never heard that before, Rob. Say that again. Say that again. Oh, I've never heard it, that it, before. It really is amazing. You can break down, just look at the meaning of each letter of the word Yeshua. Right. Re- reading right to left, it translates to the hand that destroys the establishment of the eye. That's just amazing. And so where he says, I came to destroy the works of the devil, man, this is what you're, you're talking about, the, the cosmic chess match, it's the, the move and counter move. We're, those moves are accelerating, and, and the pieces are falling away to the point where you're going to have two major players, Jesus Christ and the Antichrist. And Jesus Christ is going to poke the eye out. <laughs> Very cool. I'm going to have to ask you to... Uh... To, to, uh, I'll email you after the show. I want to use that, and I'll give you obviously credit with the quote, but oh, you sure. know, for, for the fine because that's just that's just too good to pass up. You know, Rob yeah. Skiba on Acceleration Radio blew me away when he said that's really <laughs> cool. Hey, we got a question here from Jim Paris. Are there any fossil or other proof of giants or men with six fingers? Were the Nephilim giants? Great question, Jim. Thanks for listening to Acceleration Radio, Rob. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about Six Finger Giants. I'd imagine there probably are. Uh, Steve Quayle has a very large volume. It's a, a book uh, called The Genesis Six Giants. You could look up on his website. He's also, if you go to his website, he has a lot of this information just posted on his website, stevequayle.com, um, that shows um, the different finds and stuff that have been documented. And I, I've got a graphic on my blog uh, that shows, it's a gra- graphic that's been circulated around the Internet. It shows basically what I call the products of the Genesis 6 experiment. And it's a black and white graphic with yellow text. And it shows a six-foot skeleton in the far left, and then it goes up to an 8.6, which is a Caesar of Rome, Goliath, 12 foot. you got another one that was found in Turkey in 1950, and a skeleton that was 15 foot. And it goes all the way up to, believe it or not, a 36-footer. It was found in 650 B.C. to 640 A.D., somewhere on there. Uh, Carthaginians uh, uncovered two this size, an earthquake, uh, uncovered one more. So, yeah, there's definitely been evidence. And, and from what I understand, every time, and I've heard second- and third-hand testimony of this from military people and stuff, fi- supposedly actually fighting these guys in Afghanistan, fighting cannibalistic giants. Uh, it's kind of hard to vet all that. Uh, you know, it's, there's second- and third-hand and stuff. But apparently there's still giants out there. There's apparently still giants in the Solomon Islands. Um, whether or not they have six fingers or six toes, I don't know. But... Uh, that's a genetic trait that's that's still uh, found in normal-sized human beings today. So whether or not that's a product of Nephilim or just some kind of freak genetic thing, I don't know. But uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, let me let me just add to that. When when American settlers moved west, they uncovered burial mounds, and I mean this is well documented. Um, they would find giant skeletons between nine and twelve feet. Uh, double rows of teeth, six digits, red hair. So that blows the whole, you know, Darwinian evolution thing, which we talked about a little bit earlier, right out of the water. Another question from Bla- Blake Smith 281. Blake Smith 281 doesn't sign his name. Not sure who it was, he or she, but hey, thanks for emailing us. Thanks for listening to the show. And this person writes, so is the 200 million man army an army of Nephilim coming from inner earth after trans-dimensional portals, the gates of hell are open, coming in UFOs? Great question. Rob, good luck with that one. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I believe it is. Um, you, if 
you read Joel chapter two there, that's a pretty freaky army that's going on there. And um, Tom Horn's done a lot of work on this, and he talks about there's a, a passage, and I forget the address, but it's in Isaiah where it says, Speak to the gates, you prophet, giants, the Gaborim, are coming to fulfill my wrath. And when you take a lot of these scriptures that talk about, you know, in the last days, these creatures coming up, Apollyon Rising, uh, you know, is the name of one of his books, but these things are, they're not normal, <laughs> put it that way. And so I believe that there's a reason why Jesus said the gates of Hades are not going to prevail, and I believe that there is an underworld. Uh, every culture on the planet has a concept of it, and they talk about it. Uh, it's been known as Hades. Uh, it's been known as Sheol. It's been, there's been a lot of terms, Agartha, uh, and Jim Wilhelmson's done a lot of work on that. So, yeah. I, I, and, and there's apparently quite a bit of evidence that says that there could very well be some openings in the, at the poles. Uh, and Admiral Beard and a lot of things that took place in the 50s, and the fact that the Nazis all took off for Antarctica. And, you know, there's a lot of w- weird speculation about all that, but I find it interesting that we're in a, in a, State where we've got this global warming, which I don't believe is due to SUVs. You know, the whole solar system is heating up. So, uh, and that these corks, these these ice corks, are starting to melt. Uh, you know, Scripture does say that men's hearts will fail them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. And and I think that's more than just earthquakes and tsunamis and stuff. I think there's going to be some pretty scary creatures coming out. And I do believe, based on my research about what's been going on in Iraq, that they're going to open up a portal. And you got CERN. Uh, there's all kinds of weirdness going on with CERN, uh, and you combine that with what's going on at the polls. Yeah, I, I think stuff's going to come out. Interesting stuff. We've got another question here. Lots of questions tonight. And thank you, um, folks, for you know writing in and, and, and being an integral part of the show. Because what's great about this is it's interactive. You know, you can call in and 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 we you know kind of put Rob on the spot. There's no, um, you know, I've got some questions that I'm going by, but. You know, when you guys start asking it, it makes it really interesting. Um, here's a question from producer Frank. Uh, are there any telltale signs that an average person could identify a Nephilim? Hmm. Great question, Frank. That is a great question. I don't know. You know, if you're watching V, <laughs> uh, I, I think it is very telling. Um, man, you know, they look totally normal. Cut their skin, they got lizard skin underneath, you know, so... Uh, yeah, I don't know what they what they really look like in real life, but you could probably answer that better than I could. Um, I, I think at, at this point, just at first first glance, I think they look normal. But I've seen some pretty weird stuff out there, and I don't want to get off on a tangent on this, but with with uh, George Bush and stuff like that. But maybe I should just leave it at that. <laughs> evil doers <laughs> doing evil deeds, because that's what evil doers do. Uh, um, lizard, the lizard. <laughs> I've, well, I've seen this stuff. Talk about it the night, though, that, that, that uh, there's a 12 year old girl has put together a website called WeAreAllRelated.com. I know, I've seen that. It's unbelievable. Yeah, we'll talk about that. We talked it's about that last night, yeah. Yeah, and that they they are all um, descendants of that, um, was it King John of, of Paginet? I forget how you pronounce it. I, I can't pronounce it either. A, 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 plantan, like a, a plantaginous or something? Yeah, the, yeah, they they yeah, are right. the branch of an, Angevins who yeah. are all apparently of demonic origin. I mean, right. you can really go. But just it's bizarre stuff. stuff, totally bizarre. You just can when you thought it was safe, right? Yeah, man. Let me yeah, ask you something, Rob. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> say, Jesus said, you, "You shall know them by their fruits." You know, and so look at what they're doing, and that's certainly if it's not a visual cue. Look at what they're doing and what they stand for and what they're about. You know, Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. Well, I was uh, recently invited, um, and I won't mention any names, but to uh, attend a, uh, a a conversion of a supposed supposedly of a Nephilim hybrid. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, th- fourth generation, the grandfather apparently, or third generation, the grandfather had uh, six fingers on both hands and on, you know, and 12 toes, or, you know, an, an, yeah, an extra of 12 toes. So, yeah, I don't, you know, I haven't seen this thing yet, don't know what I'm looking at, and um, I find it very interesting. We are in unprecedented times, folks. I realize this stuff is bizarre, really bizarre, and I understand that. But, <laughs> I mean, we're here, and this stuff happened once before in the antediluvian world, before, as, as the days of Noah, why are we surprised when we start talking about this stuff? 
Uh, Rob, we have a, um, a, a another question from Chris from Hawaii. Chris, first of all, thanks so much for listening to Acceleration Radio. And um, this person asked, Rob, have you started production on the Seed Series yet? No, uh, and that's a great question. We, uh, I've got an outline for 72 episodes. They're all outlined. Uh, in fact, I uh, was talking to, uh, I won't mention the guy's name, but he was a former head of Warner Brothers, and he says, wow, you're, you're way ahead. Most people, when they pitch a TV series, they don't, you know, they got an idea scribbled on a napkin, you know. Um, but I've got 72 episodes outlined. I've got the beginning of a show Bible put together, uh, which is largely going to come out of this, uh, this book I'm writing. And I've also got three episodes. Uh, the third one's almost complete, but it'll be wrapped up pretty quick. And I want to shoot the first three at the same time. And so I'm in fundraising mode right now. Uh, we've got to raise $4 million. That's a million dollars per episode for the first three episodes, plus a million dollars for the online infrastructure and the marketing campaign and everything to push it forward. So that's where we're at right now. Uh, we're pretty much on the ground floor in, in that regard. So, yeah, if there's somebody out there who who believes in what we're trying to do and would like to talk more about it, I'd be happy to talk with you. But, you know, I really believe that here's an example of, of why I'm doing this. I went across the street to the Cinemark parking lot, 3 o'clock in the afternoon on an average work day. The parking lot was full. The, the cinema parking lot was absolutely packed, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Went across the highway to the other side of the street to one of the largest, most influential uh, <laughs> churches in the Metroplex. I mean, this is a, a church, a 23,000-member church here in Dallas. Well. Uh, parking lot was empty. Now, I'll grant you that this probably full of maybe on Wednesday nights, maybe Saturday nights and Sunday. But the point I'm making is the parking lot of the cinema is full every day, all day, seven days a week. And, and the Nielsen report came out and said that the average American watches four to five hours worth of TV per day. You know, uh, I would say the average American probably doesn't even go to church an hour and a half per week. You know, if you stack those numbers together... <laughs> You know, is it any wonder our society has turned out the way it has? But instead of complaining about it, I'm like, you know what? Well, if we're, we're supposed to take this message of the kingdom to the world. Where's the world? Well, at least in America, they're sitting in front of the TV for five hours a day watching Lost. Maybe we need to create a show called Found. <laughs> you know, and they're, and they're filling movie theaters. So uh, what did Jesus do? He taught culturally relevant stories that illustrated kingdom principles. And that's exactly what we're trying to do at Seed. Good for you. That, that, that's what a wonderful answer. Um, another question from Aaron. Aaron, thanks for listening to Acceleration Radio. Really appreciate your patronage. Have, and Aaron writes, have you ever heard of any reports of giants associated with UFO activity or landings? Hmm. I have not. Um, I, I know there's all this kind of Aryan type, you know, people, but they're not giants that I'm aware of. Have you? Yeah, uh, Barry Chamish, an Israeli um, UFO researcher, although he stumbled into it. He wasn't a researcher, he was actually a reporter. Um, they were, uh, this is, goes back a number of years ago. He actually had a book, The Giants Return to Israel. I had met Barry and gave him my Nephilim book. This is back in 99. And uh, he looked at it and we looked at each other and uh, it's, it's, you know, we had a, some very interesting conversations. But yes, um, there was a giant, um, several giants that appeared to uh, different people over the course of a year seen by lots of different witnesses, and um, these giants were around between 9 and 12 feet tall. Mm. And, and they looked, uh, you know, they were, they, were, they were human elements, but they weren't uh, totally human, obviously. And, uh, you know, I, I have to say, uh, uh, back in 2006, I went to China on a mission trip, and we were in the center of China in a place called Wuhan, and, uh, man, there were some big guys out there. <laughs> I mean... These guys had to easily be pushing eight feet. You know, I'm like, wow. this is weird, you know. <laughs> Whether they're Nephilim, I don't know, but they were, they were some big dudes. We just got this in from um, one of our watchers, Prince Harry Ives, North Pole Trek. Uh, Prince Harry is determined to join wounded soldiers on a landmark trek to the North Pole. Isn't that interesting? So, mm. you know, it's just uh, the Royals want to go to the North North Pole. Why are they the Royals? You know, why do we all? It's just nonsense. This guy, I just, I can't stand royalty. It drives me nuts. It's like we all have to bow, and for why? Because why? Because you're, you're the son of the stinking king, and the king's stinking son, as they say in, in the, oh, what's the name of that movie? I can't think of it. But uh, the Princess Bride, the king's stinking son. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's, with all due respect, I mean, I know there, but it's like, who, who set this thing up? You know, it's just like, right. wait a minute, you know, it's just, uh, anyway, I digress. Um, 
what? Oh, another question. Let me. I'm. I'm going to take this one. Hold on. Let me see what we have here. Okay, maybe it, this is from Richard. Uh, Richard Holbrook. Thanks, Richard, for writing. L.A., maybe a silly question. Richard, there are no silly questions. Never, never, never. Okay? Maybe a silly question. So it's not a silly question. I'm going to change that. L.A., this is a serious question, but is it possible that Nephilim exist who do not realize they are Nephilim? Ooh, that's a great question, Richard. Rob? Yeah, well, I definitely think so. I would definitely think so. And, you know, when you combine that with what uh, Russ Dizdar is doing in, with his right. Black Awakening and, and these super soldiers and satanic ritual abuse stuff. I mean, there's a combination of these things. You know what I mean? These, the, the satanic rit ritual abuse people, these guys are normal. They're just fractured. You know, the, their personalities have been fractured. But then you've got these other guys who are, you know, are genetic experiments that David Jacobs has been dealing with and, and you've been writing about and doing shows about. So, sure. you know, uh, uh, what, the way I look at it is the devil is outnumbered two to one. And as far as angels go, so he's trying to supplement those numbers by building his own little army of all these other things. So yeah, I think I think they're out there, and I think you know they're not readily identifiable. Right. I, I you know, Russ and I have talked about this because we both um, we look at it from two different paradigms, sort of, and yet they both trace back to the same source, which is Lucifer, Satan, the fallen cherub, the fallen one, and. Um, Something is going on. He is building an army, and you know it's it's funny. The the Lord of the Rings and and Tolkien was a was a Christian, and it's interesting how you know Sauron prepares his army and gets it yep. all set before he springs a trap. And what is what is Second Thessalonians tells us? The mystery of iniquity is working two thousand years ago. So he's had two millennia to get his ducks in line, so to speak. And I don't think it's any accident, um, you know, that we're in the times that we're in, and things are about to. Um, you know, come to a head. Rob, that's pretty much all the time we have uh, for tonight. Tell us where we can keep track of Seed and, and, and where to go. Yeah, SeedTheSeries.com. I'll just leave that out there because everything I'll do will kind of funnel out of that. So if you go to SeedTheSeries.com, there's two links when you go right to the main page. Uh, there's one that says So and one that says See. If you go to the Seed, it gives you a bunch of information and videos and stuff. If you go to So, it's an opportunity for you to get involved. This is, I look at this as a ministry trying to reach the world. So if you want to get behind us, there's a way for you to do that there on the So link. Hey, Rob, thanks so much for coming on Acceleration Radio. It's been a pleasure. And it, yeah. two hours went by really quick, lots of questions, and we pretty much got to all of them and all of our phone callers. Thank you all for listening to Acceleration Radio. really appreciate your support. Check out the Watchers DVD. We are selling these things like hotcakes. And um, my good friend and producer, Richard Shaw, and I will be working on Watchers 2. I will tell you the, la uh, the title of this as time uh, allows me to. Not tonight. I'll, I'll probably spring out in the coming weeks, but we are starting the film Watchers 2 on Friday. But you need to get Watchers 1 because Watchers 2 isn't available yet. And you can get that by going to lamarzuli.net, lamarzuli.net. Our guest next week is going to be uh, exorcist and personal friend of mine, Richard Grund. He just returned from Connecticut with some fascinating uh, um, pictures of orbs and that he took and he will fill us in exactly what happened in Connecticut. Um, there was a, a d definitely demonic uh, entities manifesting and Richard and his team cleared them out. Uh, I will also, just so you guys know, there is a conference up in that area in Connecticut, March 27th to 29th. And check my website on Saturday. I've got three speaking engagements in March, and I'll be all over the place. So hopefully we can connect with some of you. Connecticut, Albuquerque, and Yuba, Northern California. My name is Elia Marzulli. This has been Acceleration Radio, folks. Great to have you here. Really appreciate your listening to us. Go check out my blog every day. I blog six days a week. lamarzulli.wordpress.com. And um, it's very pertinent stuff that I blog about. Check that out, folks. Go to the website, lamarzulli.wordpress.com. And also check out Rob Skiba's website. His links are on my site, on my uh, blog site. So go check that out. Remember, folks, I will see you either in the air or on the air. God bless everybody and good night.